let me start off by introducing Sabrina Paulos. Sabrina has been working as a licensed midwife in New Mexico since 2017, supporting families on their journeys through pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. Practicing as a home birth wife, midwife, Sabrina loves being able to support individualized care plans, informed decision-making, and continuity of care with every birthing person to help them have a safe, empowered birth experience that everyone deserves. So without further ado, um, Sabrina, we would love to hear all about you and what you do as a midwife. Hi, so thank you for that. Glad to be here today. Um, yeah, as, as Marissa said, I've been a home birth midwife here in Las Cruces for three years now. Um, I am a certified professional midwife and licensed midwife, which means that my education and training has been focused specifically on out-of-hospital midwifery care and birth. Um, and I'm here today to talk about how things are working in this, in this strange world that we're in. So since the, the start of the coronavirus pandemics um, began affecting communities in this country earlier this year, we have really seen a big increase in people who are interested in home birth. Um, as home birth midwives, we've always joked that we have really good job security for any apocalypse that comes, but I don't think any of us were really expecting this, this world that we're, that we're finding ourselves in. Um, but yeah, I'm just here to talk about that. So when we talk about home birth and the coronavirus, um, there have been a lot of different reasons that people have started looking for alternatives to, to the hospital. Um, one of the big ones, of course, is that people are interested in avoiding exposure to the coronavirus. Um, in the hospital environment, it's really common to have a dozen or more people who are in and out of your room during your stay there, um, people changing a, a change of shift and all of that, whereas in home birth, you usually are seeing the same person for your prenatal care and at your birth and at your postpartum care. Um, and so usually that's a, a little different exposure factor for more people or for most people that, that some people feel comfortable with. Um, other, other factors that people are considering are who they're able to have with them for their support people. Uh, a lot of facilities are really limiting how many people you can have with you, who you can have with you, whether they're able to come and go and that sort of thing. And there's a lot more flexibility available to people who are planning on a home birth. Um, some facilities are trying to enforce people wearing masks in labor, which is, is not a concern for people birthing at home. And, and then there's also some big differences in how prenatal and postpartum care are looking in this world. So a lot of people are having the, the number of visits that they have prenatally be limited to just a couple sometimes. Um, and not everybody's comfortable with that. So in midwifery care, we're still, we've made a lot of adjustments and changes, of course, to, to meet this, um, the demands of this new world and, and everybody's safety. But, but we're still seeing people on a regular basis. We're still ensuring that, that everything is going well, screening regularly and all of that. And, and we're continuing with postpartum care where some people aren't being offered postpartum visits after, after a hospital birth. Um, and then just aside from all of the reasons that people look into, um, into an out of hospital birth when things are, are different in the world, there are a lot of reasons that people look into it in general and a lot of benefits that people get. So with out of hospital birth and with a home birth midwife, um, people are usually, um, we see a significant reduction in the rates of cesarean sections. So most people, um, most practices only have about a 5% cesarean birth rate in home birth versus 15% or higher for low risk people in the hospital. Um, most people who are planning a home birth, 89% will have a normal vaginal birth at home with no pain medications. Um, for people who are interested in having a vaginal, vaginal birth after cesarean, 87% um, of people will be successful with that when they work with a home birth midwife towards that goal. Um, with these things, we also see higher APGAR scores. We see lower rates of uh, neonatal intensive care unit admission for babies. Um, 
there's overall just a, a big difference in what prenatal and postpartum care looks like as far as the amount of time that you spend with your provider. So we'll often spend an hour or more with our people in a prenatal visit, just discussing what's going on with your life, um, how your diet and exercise are, stress levels, questions and concerns, all of those things. Um, we also have a, a, a frequent postpartum schedule that includes breastfeeding support and well baby care. So most people for their, their postpartum visits, instead of having to get themselves and their babies, babies ready to go to an office, we, if they tell us that we can come in, they don't have to get out of bed and, and we're able to see them there and do checks on mom and baby after the birth. Um, and all of these things are, are not only great for just postpartum in general, but particularly where people are trying to stay out of, out of doctor's offices and things like that. Um, so, and then there are a couple other things that, um, that are just different in, in community-based midwifery care. And some of those are what's considered high risk for people who are looking for a normal birth and to be supported with that. So things like um, people who are over the age of 35 are often automatically risked as high risk in OB care, but in, in mater uh, midwifery care, not so much. Um, people with BMI over 30, same thing. But again, we tend to look at a whole person and a whole picture of health versus which boxes can people be fit into. Um, and so a lot of people find that this, people who are looking for a normal, natural birth to be supported find that midwifery care is a good fit for them. Um, some of the things that help to ensure that midwifery care and out of hospital birth are safe are working with a skilled provider, um, working with somebody who has training and experience in an out of hospital setting, um, supporting physiological birth, and, and also recognizing when things do deviate from normal and when intervention does become necessary. Um, so I was trying to, trying to keep this on a, a short time frame to make sure I didn't talk forever. Um, there are a lot of different things that can be discussed with home birth midwifery and the differences between um, regular hospital-based care and community-based care. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that people might have that I didn't touch on already. Great, thank you so much, Sabrina. And we'll talk to you more as we uh, go through the rest of the panel. Um, I now want to introduce um, Ruth Romo. Ruth is a family nurse practitioner and the director of Full Circle Health Center. She offers a full range of healthcare services with a special emphasis on prevention and wellness from a holistic perspective. Her specialty is women from, uh, oh my gosh, what's that word? Menopause, from where to menopause? Did I spell it? <laughs> As a, I'll, I'm I'll, sorry, I'll I'm not say it again, Ruth. <laughs> From um, she provides services to all folks of the gender spectrum. Oh, menarchy! Oh, oh menarchy! Menarchy! Yeah. Pause. Menarchy. <laughs> okay. Um, and she's been working in the healthcare industry for 20 years. First as a licensed midwife, then as an RN, and now as a nurse practitioner, all here in the southwestern U.S. border. Her goal is to empower people with the knowledge and access to high quality, affordable, evidence-based and patient-centered healthcare. Her services include, but are not limited to the, uh, to annual exams, GYN exams, family planning, including IUDs, testing and treatment for STDs, PREPs, HCVs treatments, and MATs. Lots of acronyms, most of which I know. She's a reproductive justice advocate and the co-founder of an advocacy group called the Las Cruces Coalition for Reproductive Justice that works on reproductive issues, including abortion care that affect our border area. Ruth, I'm sorry I ruined your bio. Um, and um, please go for it. Tell us about yourself. Uh-oh. No worries. Did we lose Ruth? Are you there? 
Sure. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Can you all, you can hear me. Um, so I wanted to talk, yes, can, I'm speaking. Can you hear me? Hello? Oh, why is it not working? Well, we hear you. We just thought, there you go. You're back. Okay, can everybody hear me now? Good. Uh, okay, so I wanted to talk about birth options. Um, and I wanted to talk about it a little bit in my life story. Um, currently, most of us have the choice to parent or the choice to not parent. And that's what reproductive justice is. It's really the choice to parent or to not parent. Um, fact, nearly a half of pregnancies among U.S. women are actually unintended pregnancies. Fact, four in ten women terminate their pregnancy and abortion. Fact, without birth control, 90 and 100 young women will get pregnant each year. So these facts are really relevant to my life. Um, for me, growing up post Roe v. Wade, um, I have had many opportunities for pregnancies and non-pregnancies in my lifetime that I'm grateful for. Um, in fact, in high school, I was one of those girls that actually got pregnant. And I chose to have an abortion at that time. And I'm confident to say that because of that abortion, it's allowed me to get to where I am now. So where I am now, um, my background is as an apprentice midwife. Um, I too chose to um, become a midwife. It was a political choice. I have always believed that birth is not a medicalized or a hospitalized um, procedure, that our bodies are made for birth, some of our bodies. So I became a midwife um, and came to El Paso, um, Texas, where we have a very large midwifery training center. Um, and there I completed my midwifery training and then I had my own babies, born home birth at home, um, beautiful home births. And one of the challenges about being a midwife um, or involved in birth, as you've heard, is uh, being on call. <laughs> so right now we have one of our speakers who's not able to be here because call happens, birth happens. Um, and as a midwife, um, I found that it was really difficult for me to be on call because I became a single mother and decided I'm going to still be involved in healthcare and women's healthcare. So I became a nurse and then a nurse practitioner. So as a nurse practitioner, as a family nurse practitioner, um, I'm so fortunate because I get to put my hands on women. <laughs> and we get to do, as you mentioned in the bio, um, I get to provide women with options. I get to provide women with choices about how they really want to live their reproductive life. So our reproductive life cycle is a good 30, 35 years so during that time we get to like choose hopefully we get to try to become pregnant or to avoid pregnancy so a lot of my work is really supporting women and choosing pregnancy or avoiding pregnancy um, we have a lot of really wonderful new not new we have a lot of wonderful options and again we have these 35 years where we're having to think about these kinds of questions so birth control is a, a super it's a it's a reproductive justice point um, you need to have access to making these choices and birth control is one of them so we I provide LARC which is the long-acting reversible contraception and if anybody has questions about that we can talk about that I do a lot of um, as um, Sabrina mentioned now that we're in this time of COVID um, 
and things are so strange, people are trying to avoid hospital situations. So small family practice like mine is a great place because we do do personalized, individualized care. And I'm fortunate because we can, as a family nurse practitioner, I get to do all kinds of prenatal and postpartum care and then work closely with midwives for the birth. I wanted to mention that, um, again, times of COVID, one of the things that's happening, not so much in home birth, but just in the birth control world and abortion world is telemedicine. Telemedicine is something that's now allowing us to improve access to birth control options and uh, abortion access. So at any point, I'd love to answer some questions about that because that's a really important thing um, in, in terms of things changing. Politically, I just wanted to put this out there to everybody who might be watching. There is an act called the Women's Health Protection Act right now that is a really important um, legislation that's happening that's going to overturn the Hyde Amendment, um, which is about, again, more uh, access to our choices in terms of possible abortion access. Um, and it's called the Women's Health Protection Act. So please take a look out for that. Um, I want again to say a huge plug for home births and clinic births. Um, hospitals are really for sick people. So we're gonna talk quite a bit more about that, I imagine, in the questions and the answers. Um, pregnancy is just a state of good health. We really need to remind women, our bodies, we want to empower our health. Um, what else did I want to mention? Uh, lastly, I just want to end by saying it's never simple. Our reproductive life cycles are not simple. It's complicated. We have, again, many, many years to make decisions about, about our lives. Um, and I wanted to end with just this little video um, animation, since there's this whole animation thing going, and it's called Womb Stories. It's never simple. Marissa, would you say that, please? Yes, I will.
Hello Richard, I'm Caroline Williams, the CEO of Bodyform. One right. second, it doesn't seem to be visualization. YouTube did not want to stop with that one. <laughs> So, um, Ruth and Sabrina, thank you, Ruth. That was really fun, actually. Um, could, I'm going to unmute you both now. And I was thinking, we had a couple of questions that were sent in to us. Um, so if we could kind of start with those questions. And then, um, and then you know, you guys could tell us anything else you wanted to elaborate on. And then we can open up the questions for the rest of the participants that are in the room. Um, so one of the first questions was what would happen if an emergency situation arrives while child birthing at home? Yeah, we get this question a lot. Um, so of course, childbirth can be really unpredictable. Um, one of the things that helps is doing regular prenatal care with the same provider. Um, so seeing the same provider, every time, every month, every couple of weeks, and then every week towards the end, allows your provider to do really thorough screening to really know what's normal for you, what's not normal. Um, and then just through the, the labor and birth process, we're, we're doing monitoring of mom and baby through labor. We're keeping a really careful eye out for any, any red flags or any concerns. Um, should something come up where we feel like it's concerning and it's not something that we can handle at home, we would transfer to the hospital in that situation. Um, now there are a, a variety of things that, that do sometimes come up and that we're, we're well experienced and trained for handling. So we bring oxygen equipment, we bring IVs, we bring medications for bleeding after the birth, that kind of thing. Um, but if there's a situation that that starts to move beyond the realm of being safe at home, then we just transport. I wanted to add that Sabrina was mentioning earlier, um, that is all true. And we have oftentimes as midwives, we have um, conversations with the hospital uh, people and or EMTs. And lately, Sabrina was mentioning that EMTs are kind of are kind of working with midwives and trying to keep moms home a little bit longer than and give them more opportunities at home. Did you want to add something to that? Oh, I can't hear you. Sorry. Um, there, of course, there are always always certain situations and certain extremes that will be safer at the hospital, but definitely as the hospital has become a little bit more of a dangerous place with just the risk of, of contact with COVID-19, um, that, that risk-benefit balance and, and those decisions have been shifting a little bit. We have seen some of that. I was told that once you have a, a cesarean section, that the safest option is to deliver your next child via C-section rather than attempting a natural birth in the time of COVID. Is this still the safer and only option? And what considerations and recommendations 
would they make to a mom who might be facing a non-elective C-section? Yeah, so this has been a controversial topic well before the rise of a worldwide pandemic. Um, the that risk benefit balance is is not super straightforward. So when people are told by their providers that a repeat cesarean is safer, they're saying that there's a, a smaller chance of the complication of uterine rupture. What's not usually discussed is that with a repeat C-section or with any C-section, your risk of significant hemorrhage and other complications that can go along with that are also higher. And that every time you have a C-section, the risk of the complication of placenta accreta, or placenta accreta, pardon me, also increases. So for people who are planning on having more than two children, every time you have a C-section, the, the risk of having a, a serious complication in the third stage of labor increases with that. So whether it's safer or not to do that at the hospital or home, depends on a lot of individual factors. And those are things that we're usually discussing when we do consults with people to talk about what their history was, why they had a C-section the first time, how the surgery went, things like that to determine whether that's really a true statement at all. Um, now, in the time of Corona, there, that of course adds a whole extra level of going to the hospital with a C-section. You're, you're generally admitted to the hospital for a longer period of time significant surgeries and being put under have a stronger impact on your immune system and, and those sorts of things. Um, and so it can be an even somewhat different conversation than it was before for how people feel comfortable with that or not. Um, and then for um, just to, to answer the part of people who are not having elective C-section, so assuming that it is medically necessary in that instance, um, really people have the option of helping to advocate for themselves to ensure that the people who are coming in and out of their room are following appropriate protocols to help reduce their own exposure. Um, hospitals should be following policies of keeping babies in the room with mothers still, even when there's concerns about infection. Um, people coming in and out of the room should be wearing appropriate, um, appropriate PPE and things so that they're not exposing the family unnecessarily things like that. Uh, one other thing that I just wanted to add regarding, and I'm sorry if it's loud back here. Um, can somebody correct me? I know we can legally do VBACs in the state of New Mexico, but in Texas, for example, you can't for home births. Is that correct? No, that's not, that's not correct. It's legal in both places. Um, in New Mexico, our state practice guideline is um, following a single C-section that it's cleared. In Texas, it actually doesn't have that limit. Oh. Um, but, but it's an option in both places, absolutely. And, and then, of course, it just comes down to discussing individual risk factors with your provider. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I'll just kind of ask a question. You know, as a non-parent, but someone who's very interested in um, the potential of parenting, could you talk about um, parenting older women, um, midw midwife, uh, uh, which you know, however you'd like to chat about it, women who are are over the age of thirty-five that are thinking about having kids. Um, can I start? It's all about preconception care. Um, so preconception care is super important no matter what age you are. Um, and really just taking care of your body. Um, diet, exercise, those are like so important. So it starts with preconception care. And Sabrina, do you want to add on there? <laughs> uh, I mean, honestly, that that's kind of the big thing and that's the big thing with most of those really big boxes that we try to fit people into so so-called advanced maternal age or high bmi that sort of thing we recognize that 
it's about so many other health factors and life factors that determine whether there's risk with that or not. So with people over the age of 35, for instance, people who are healthy and active and all of that tend to have really excellent outcomes as compared to somebody, you could be 25, but have none of those things. And that doesn't just automatically put you in a, a lower risk category because you're only 25, right? And so it's really about about looking at that whole picture, about looking at what people's lifestyles look like, um, how healthy they are overall, and then just doing that follow-up care, that prenatal care where we're seeing people on a regular basis to make sure that everything is continuing normally and that there's not anything coming up that's concerning. Um, I'd love to open it up to if anyone else in the room has questions. Um, Courtney's watching. You could raise your hand if you wanted to ask a question out loud, or you could type your question into the Q&A, um, and we'll add you into the rotation. Um, I'll, I'll just, while we're kind of looking to see if people have questions, I'll ask one more question, um, which is, have you, in this last couple of months during COVID, seen drastic differences or drastic changes in mother's preparedness or, or, or hospital preparedness or um, home birth, you know, just difference in numbers, difference of, um, of reactions of, of care. Um, I can say that I think a lot of people are afraid of having children right now. So I, I'm seeing a lot more interest in birth control uh, and options, uh, especially the long acting reversible contraceptives because it doesn't require a lot of um, day to day and uh, day to day maintenance, basically long acting reversible contraceptives. So I'm certainly seeing a lot more of that given our time where we're at right now. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I would say, I mean, we across the board have seen a lot more interest in home birth and out of hospital options. As far as preparedness, I feel like there's really been a mix of that. Um, of how much research people are doing before they come to us to ask about home birth as an option. So there are people who at one end of the spectrum have always really considered it. And this was just like the straw that put them over the edge to, to finally decide that they were doing a home birth this time. Um, to other people who heard about it on the news one time and decided to look up their local midwife and, and don't always have a full understanding of of what the process looks like and what those differences are. Um, so it's been, there's been a lot of educational conversations and things doing, doing consults with people for that. And I'll just ask one more question because, you know, I'm from New York. So I don't know if any other people have questions. I haven't looked at the chat, but, you know, being from New York, it, it seems to me that there's, a lot, and this might be way off base, so you can totally tell me that, but there seems like there's a lot more connection um, to birthing naturally, holistic, potential home birth, working with doulas and midwives in New Mexico than there are in New York, especially in more of like the routineness of childbirth in New York versus you know, because I think if you, like, you think about midwives and doulas in New York with people who really have the money to do that, um, everyone else goes to the hospital. Um, would you say that that's true or that's a misconception? Is it about dollars? Is it about what it, like, what, yeah, what would be those differences within the state, within those states, the more populated potentially states in New Mexico and is there a difference in the amount of money that it takes to do those things? Um, so across the board, home birth is significantly cheaper than a hospital birth. Um, the difference comes down to insurance coverage. 
for a lot of people. So in places like New York, where it may not be covered by insurance, you are looking at people who can afford to just pay out of pocket, whereas people who don't have that kind of money just sitting in a savings account do find their, their options a lot more limited. Um, one of the amazing things about New Mexico is that New Mexico Medicaid covers home birth, covers home birth midwives. Um, which allows us to provide service to, it's 70% of the pregnant people in New Mexico are on Medicaid while they're pregnant. Um, and the, we're generally talking about those are not people who have large saving accounts the, that they can fall back on. So I think just that kind of accessibility where we do have coverage here, um, where people are able to access it makes a really big difference in who who goes through with that. Um, the other thing too is New Mexico, just as, as a state, as a place, has a really long history of midwifery that hasn't been broken in the way that it has in other states. So New York is actually a really prime example of where the, um, the medical lobby, the American Medical Association and other groups have done a lot of work to make it not just difficult for midwives to practice there, but actually illegal for midwives like myself to practice there. Um, so while I'm a licensed midwife covered by Medicaid here in New Mexico, if I were to move to New York today and try to open a practice, it would be a felony. Um, and those kinds of differences make a really big difference in just how normal community birth is in a place or not. One thing I want to add, I'm also from New York and my daughter is there now all that is true um and doulas right now are having a very large kind of uh are becoming a thing within the new york city um birthing arenas and i'm sorry our doula wasn't here because that's becoming something that is becoming more widely acceptable um in birth situations maybe not home births but at least having the support of a doula practitioner within the hospital setting is becoming much more uh, acceptable and especially in New York. And for people who either don't have access to a home birth or don't feel, feel comfortable with it, a doula is a really wonderful way to bring some of that same advocacy into the hospital setting with you. Um, doulas are really great for helping people um, follow their birth plan, have other people listen to their birth plan to, to really empower people in those experiences. So, yeah. Great, are there any other questions? Does anyone else have any burning questions that they would like to ask? Um, are they currently allowing doulas in the hospitals? So locally, the last update that I had was that they're not, that you can have one support person. That support person has to stay in the room with the laboring person. Um, so like they're not allowed to leave to the lobby and come back or they won't be allowed re-entry. Um, so potentially if somebody wanted to make their doula that person, they could, but then it would mean that they wouldn't be able to have any family support with them. So a lot of doulas are um, providing virtual support as best they can. So just set them up in the corner on a FaceTime. Um, it's a similar situation for myself where usually when we have transfers from a home birth, I would transfer with people to the hospital and stay there and just act as a doula, but currently we're not able to to do that without taking the, the position that a family member would be holding there. Um, and so trying to just do more virtual support, FaceTime and Zoom and that sort of thing so that we can still be there for the conversations and provide support in what is a really less than ideal situation. Would one of you mind just for people like me who don't know, what is the difference between a doula and a midwife? Um, yeah, absolutely. So doulas are um, emotional support people, informational support people. So they will generally meet with clients prenatally to get an idea of what sorts of things are important to them in their birth plan, what sorts of things they want to advocate for. Um, 
traditionally when they're allowed into hospital settings or when they're present for home births, they offer physical support, you know, massage and counter pressure and those sorts of things through labor and birth. They, many of them also incorporate breastfeeding support into their postpartum care or just general household emotional support and things like that. Um, however, doulas really don't do any clinical care. So doulas will not be checking your blood pressure. They won't be listening to baby's heart tones. They don't check dilation, that sort of thing. Whereas a midwife, midwife fills, fills those clinical roles. And, and often there will be overlap in the support that we give. So in a, in a home birth, we do a lot of back, back massage and counter pressure and hip squeezes and all of those things too. But we're there specifically to fill that clinical role is our is our first priority as midwives. And then would you say that, I mean, if you're saying, you know, you're a nurse practitioner and or, I mean, this would go, I think, maybe more to your, and or OBGYNs, they, they can have the option of doing home births but they generally work in hospitals, is that right? No, um, so OBGYNs are not trained in home births or clinic births. They're really just trained in hospital births. Some of them will choose to become trained in home births. Um, as a nurse practitioner, I can only do births if I also am a licensed midwife. So I can't just do it under my nurse practitioner license. I can do it, I can do the prenatal care and postpartum care, but not the actual birth. That has to be by a licensed midwife. Um, and it could be a certified nurse midwife, which is a, another advanced practice clinician who does at times get training for clinic and home birth, but it really depends on the program that they go to for their training and their interest, basically. Great. And I mean, do you, do you feel that, you know, in every, every woman, cause it sounds like, you know, both of you are so, are very, very focused on a woman's choice in this matter. So, you know, whether a woman goes and actually, let me ask this question a different way. If you are working with a doula, is it good to have a doula and a midwife? Like, or would you make that choice between having a doula and a midwife? And then if you had to go to the hospital, you then would work with an OBGYN? So there, because there's more of that overlap in midwifery and doula care in the home birth setting, I would say it's a lot less common for people to have doulas at home. Um, not necessarily redundant, though, and particularly going back to talking about whether we're filling a clinical role or an emotional supportive role. Um, in those instances, when things are a little more difficult, having a doula present can be great because your midwife might be focused on other things that are going on. Um, However, I would say often in those instances, the prenatal work that doulas do is different just because uh, a lot of the preparation for a, uh, a hospital birth that goes into doula care is figuring out what you want that aligns with hospital protocol, what you want that's different than hospital protocol, and really trying to figure out how to advocate that in a setting that is not always set up for it. Whereas in midwifery, midwifery care, we're really just centered around the experience of every individual. So, um, I mean, things like delayed cord clamping and skin to skin care and all of those things are just standard care in midwifery practice. And it's not something that you have to fight for when you've just had a baby. Um, so, so sometimes that aspect of doula care with midwifery care can look different, but, but the actual physical support part of that really just depends on what people feel like they want and need for their support team and labor. Does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, okay. Th it, this is all new to me, so I, I can ask the, what I would assume might be the very novice questions. <laughs> 
Well, I really appreciate uh, both Ruth and Sabrina for being here and giving us your knowledge and answering all my questions. <laughs> um, if we don't have any other questions, I'll just say thank you for being here and being so open and giving us your expertise and your knowledge. And um, yeah, Courtney, sorry, did I miss a question? Yep, a question just came in. Um, is there additional concern or a different kind of care for overweight moms? That's a question. So this is also a really common reason that people will seek out home birth midwives is that in conventional maternity care, people are often seen as the number on the scale before the actual person that they are and their whole life factor. Um, so when we talk about concerns with things like age or weight, um, we're, we're talking about the differences between risk factors and actual risks. So having a higher BMI puts you at higher risk of developing certain conditions in pregnancy. However, by no means is it a guarantee that you will develop those things. And should you not have any of those problems, they're not a problem. So. The, the number itself really isn't the concern. And that's where we get back to what are people's activity levels like? How is their diet? A lot of that preconception counseling and that prenatal care um, play significantly bigger factors than, than whatever the number on the scale is. She said, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope that everyone can join us on August 22nd for the Alone Together. And I appreciate you all being here. Thank you.